Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Meshlove. Today we're going to explore the topic of life and death. My guest, my dear old friend, Daryl Robert Schoon, is a minister with the Temple of Universality in Tucson, Arizona. He is also author of many books, including You Can't Always Get What You Want, Light in a Dark Place. The Time of the Vulture, Report to the House Select Committee on Intelligence, Is God Confused and the Way to Heaven. Welcome again, Daryl. Very good, Jeffrey. <laughs> I'm watching you, you know, because I can't keep track of these myself anyway. That's what my fingers are for. And I'm looking at you, I'm going, all right, this is good. And then you got to the end. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> good. Well, you wrote them. I just have to recite them. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Well, um, you know, you, this, the suggested topic is life and death. And when you told me that, I thought, well, that's interesting because I'm a spiritualist. Yes. And, you know, we don't believe in death. Mm -hmm. not, that the that, not that the transition called death does not happen. All right? We may be fools, but we're not fools on that point. All right? Now, in my growth or my experience, um, my first real thing or question of it happened before I got into the spiritualist church. Okay? We were with Marshall Thurber's Positive Deviant Network, yes. select group of out-of-the-box thinkers that Marshall brought together, all right? And this was the first meeting, so we really didn't know each other. There was 70 of us. There was, the <coughs> dues were like $5,000 a year. We met four times a year. Very interesting group of people. Well, this guy got up to give his presentation. We're all members. And he had been a gang leader in Toronto as a youth, all right? He now owned all the real estate, uh, all the REMAX franchises in one state in the country. He had a lot of money, all right? And he and a friend were like sort of partners, all right, in their business deals. And they were very different, all right? The guy who, who was presenting first was very outgoing, very slick, very smooth, and very metaphysical, very spiritual. His friend and his partner was very quiet. He was the money guy, hands-on guy, very like this, and didn't speak a lot, all right? But they were, they'd done all these business deals together. And so the first guy gets up and he says, listen, he said, you know, we really, me and my blah, 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 I won't name them, have disagreed on a lot of things. And one of them is about God, all right? And I said, what, when are you going to believe in God? And he said, until I have proof, okay, or, or whatever. That, but that's what kind of guy he was, mm -hmm. all right? So then he, then he turns and says, I'm going to have him tell you his story. And he knows what story I want him to tell you. So this guy gets up. We've, we never met any of us, be, most of us, before two, two days before. So this guy gets up, he's, he, and he's nervous. You can clearly, he's, he's not used to speaking in front of crowds. And he goes, he said, uh, could you all give me a clap? A clap. Because he was that nervous. And I thought, how touching. He was that genuine that he wanted us to climb. And he says, all right, sir. He said, and he starts to tell us a story. And he said that he had a, a really bad heart condition. All right. And um, they had just done an IPO. Initial public offering. offering. And he said for it was so it was his birthday and they had a big party for him. And there they were. OK. So he says he goes to the party and he steps out of the limo or car and massive heart attack. Fall, doesn't know, he's just gone. All right. And then he says, the next thing he knows, he is having what we call out of the body experience. He sees his body on the floor, laying there. He's watching it. All right. And the next thing he knows, he's, he sees like a tunnel, as they say. And he's going on this thing and he hears a voice. It was his grandfather's voice. His grandfather was dead. All right. And a hand comes out. For his hand, and he puts his hand into it, and he said, he remembered he put his hand out, and his arm was that of a six-year-old boy, the age when he knew his grandfather. 
So they're walking along, and he said he felt great. He wasn't afraid. He just felt really good. And his grandfather said, you know, laddie, that was his name for him. You know, laddie, this is not your time. You have to go back. He says, but when I, you go back, I want you to tell your father something. Tell your father that I love him. <laughs> and then he said, the next thing he knew, <laughs> he was on a stretcher. Everybody was around him. Paramedics, you know, giving this stuff. And they're getting ready to load him in the ambulance. And his eyes opened. The people started screaming like, <laughs> he's, he's not dead. And his father is looking at him. All right, his grandfather, who was there, it's because it was his birthday. And he says, no, his, 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 uh, oh, he's, tell my, tell my son, who was, who was his father. Right. So his grandfather is, his father is looking at him, like really concerned. And he said, grandpa just t t said to tell you he loves you. <laughs> and his father broke down in tears. I, one, he, the kid is alive. And two, the message about his grandfather. Mm -hmm. And his grandfather had never, he, his father told him later, he had never told him those words. Never said, I love you. All right? And he's, and, and, and the guy who was giving the talk was clearly uncomfortable. He didn't like talking in crowds. And he told, just told us this sort of outrageous story. Yeah. All right? So that was 2005, the first meeting of the PDN. All right? What happens later, the next, uh, then we see Hoyt, who predicts this change in my Gordon life. Robinette, the psychic. Who's a spiritualist medium. He's a spiritualist medium. Yes. Well, very well known that, in certain circles. We've talked about extensively in a previous interview on spiritualism, which I'm going to link to okay. in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. For those who haven't watched that interview, it would be a good one to watch. Yes. So <laughs> we meet Hoyt in 2005, all right? And I know psychic, I know of psychic phenomena, all right? And I didn't know it like you knew it. I, I found out later, much later, that you had studied this as a, as a reality. All right. And you had studied at a time when I sort of blew it all off. That's a, I'm very dismissive. I'm a fixed sign. I'm an Aquarian and we're either into it or out of it. There's very little gray area. All right. So it wasn't in my, per so I was out of it. Okay. So we had, a friend had introduced us to him. She said she knew the psychic. So we go see this guy in 2005 and he was incredible. 2006, he told me, and we went over before, he said, uh, he, he, and that's when I wasn't talking to anybody, I was really, I was at war with the world, wasn't talking to anybody, you know, you, that's, that was how I was then, and, and, and he, Hoyt, his first thing he says, you're a teacher, I go, no, then he goes, he's hearing things, I think, I don't know what they hear, he's psychic, I'm not, not that way, psychic. he goes, um, you teach, I, no, then he goes, you know things that other people don't know. I said, everybody thinks that. They know things that other people don't know. I said, I have no audience. I have no voice. I have no agreement in this world. And he said, that will soon change. People will begin seeking you out. In fact, that's how we reconnected. We had, the last time we had seen each other was 12 years before <coughs> in San Francisco. All right, we, which we discussed on our last yes, program. That's right. And now this is twelve years later, and you, you had been re, you you were a, a known figure. <laughs> you tell surprised Jeffrey Bishop. I mean, because when we both met, we were hippies. And, and yeah. You were in this uh, paranoia. You, know, you were out. You were still going to graduate school. Yeah. I'd gone to law school, flunked out. I had a Chinese restaurant, yeah. but we're still the same. We're still in that same milieu. I uh, was a graduate student in criminology oh, when I first met you. Dude, we should have talked, Jeffrey. <laughs> I could have told you many things if I had foreknowledge. Yes. In fact, I want to make it. I'm going to make an observation. So you were in criminology. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you a story. So I, there, I, there, I found myself at Lompoc Federal Prison Camp. All right. No fences, lowest level security, so there's no danger, you know? I mean, that kind of stuff, right? And they used to have all these criminology students go through there for the dog and pony show, mm -hmm. right? 
see the prisoners. All right. So there we were at Law Polk Prison Camp, and we had these rooms. They were the the big house was now converted for high level security. You had rolls of barbed wire, under locked down guns, everything really tight. We were a camp. Mm-hmm. I call it the penalty box of the stars. All right. So we didn't have lock. We you know we weren't chained up. We were none of that stuff. But we were in a prison. So they used to take these students in <laughs> criminology classes down for the dog and pony. I saw them coming. Here they come. Here comes the assistant warden with these kids looking like this. Okay. So I knew they were coming to our room and they're looking in the windows. Okay. So they came to our room and I put up a piece of paper. I said, help. We're being held prisoner. <laughs> these people are not your friends. <laughs> I started a laugh. <laughs> All right, that's my little thing about criminology. Okay. I didn't know you had been major in criminology. I yes, I did volunteer work at San Quentin. Did you ever read um, Democracy in America by De- Tocqueville? De- Tocqueville. Well, yes, I would like that in high school. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and he had come over here to study our prisons. Yes. All right. In fact, I read it. Only after I got out of prison, because my son, who had graduated from MIT, said, Dad, you should read this. <laughs> All right? And that's when I found de Tocqueville had come over here ostensibly to study our, he did come over to study our prisons, but he found out a lot more. I mean, he really, he was psychic in many, many significant areas. All right? So, anyway, what happens is, is that we're sitting there, I, I, I do, I see, I see Hoyt. And, and I get this vision. He, he tells me I'm going to be a teacher. All right. Well, you are reading Richard Russell's Dow Theory Letter. This is the oldest newsletter on the Dow for investors in the United States. Yeah, it was during my period of, of being a commodity trading advisor. And See, I got really in, into the markets myself. In fact, until our last meeting, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. All right, yeah. that was as much surprise to me to me about you uh-huh. that you had this secret life as a commodities <laughs> advisor <laughs> and trader. Yeah, that it was to you when you were reading Richard Russell's Dow Theory Letter in night in two thousand and eight, and out of the blue he quotes somebody named Daryl Shoon on money. Yeah. Oh, I was so surprised. You were so surprised. You emailed me, yeah. and you go, Daryl. Is this you? <laughs> same name, yeah. same sign. Yeah. Is this you? <laughs> because from our pictures of each other, you as a commodities broker was no more, we're hippies. Yeah. Yeah. No more in the realm of possibility than I was who had done a long stretch in time for, for um, drug dealing, all right? And before that had been a rug trader with the Chinese, yeah. all right? And at and, 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 and a Chinese restaurant. Mm-hmm. So the idea that I'm writing about money was a pure shock to you. Yes, it was. Okay. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Hoyt was the thing that got us into spiritualism because right. there was a church in Tucson that used to sponsor him. I did not like churches. I grew up in a church. Every Sunday, put a little time, go to church, sit there, listen to it. And I was in a nice church. They weren't laying in guilt, shame, blame. They, they, were, they were kind. It was an American Baptist church. The... Uh, the forerunner of Southern Baptists broke away from the American Baptists because the American Baptists were not into slavery and the Southern boy go, hey, we're into slavery. Yeah. That's where the Southern Baptists came from. So I was part of the American, my parent, my mother went to the American Baptists and they were really nice people. Yeah. But it was a waste of time to me. All right. I just didn't relate. Yeah. So Hoy was sponsored in Tucson by a spiritualist church. I didn't even know what spiritualist church were. Okay, but Hoyt was extraordinary as a psychic. I mean, he told me things like, like he said, he said, soon people would be in see- seeking you out. You were the ones you didn't, you knew who you had already had my email. I <laughs> sought you out. <laughs> you, yeah, but you, you are, you're one of the few that had my email address. Yes. Uh-huh. All right. And you did seek me out yeah. and other people sought me out right. from around the world. Well, it, in fact, you had established quite a big reputation. Richard Russell was one of the most respected yes. uh, people. And here he is citing you me. in his newsletter. In his newsletter. But, mo- but nobody else was good. I was, in fact, people may know of uh, Mark Faber, F-A-B-E-R, mm-hmm. gloom, doom, 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 doom. he took my pieces on China verbatim and asked permission to include them in his newsletter. Uh-huh. But I majored in Asian studies, so my things on China were not just about money, but I yeah. knew about China. Yeah. But Mark Faber asked my, and I still communicate with Mark every mm-hmm. once in a while, but people don't know, there was a guy named Harry Schultz. Did you know of him? Harry Schultz, another big financial... Yeah. Uh, 
guru, guru, pundit. Yeah, pundit. He was in um, in Switzerland at the time, living there, and he contacted me. So I was. Yeah. You went from obscurity to having a major reputation, a major in, reputation. in the world of, I guess I'd call it financial forecasting. Yes, yes. So, as a result of that, what Bucky Fuller called precession, it, one thing leads, not necessarily to another, but it leads to many things sideways. We find out that Hoyt comes to Tucson, sponsored by this spiritualist church. Okay? Now, this is psychic foreknowledge. Remember I told you earlier that Martha had liver and kidney failure and life death, she was, di she was basically dying and, and she recovered, it was a miracle, okay? And it was a total miracle, all right? And we're driving back, we're coming out of intensive care in Phoenix, we're driving back to Tucson, this is two th year 2000, and Martha has basically a precognitive vision, a psychic vision. <laughs> and she said, she saw us in a church singing, and I got mad. <laughs> I had been too far away. I, she going, all right. She said, I'm not going to argue with him. I just saw it. <laughs> so seven years later, Hoyt comes to Tucson every year sponsored by this church. Okay. And I don't, so I reluctantly want to go only to hear Hoyt. Okay. And I don't, I don't even know what kind of church this is. I don't know what spiritualists are. I know nothing about them. All I knew is they sponsored the most extraordinary psychic I had ever heard or been encountered of in my life. This man was incredible. All right. So we go, and, and Hoyt liked us because we were a little crazy. <laughs> and so he, the, the church was so booked up when he came, he told the church, make sure these people get appointments. He wanted to make sure that we had access to him when he was there. All right. So Martha and I go to this church, and that's where we're sitting there and, and in the spiritualist church, and I only went there to sign up to see Hoyt, and we find out there's no sign-ups that weekend. Mm. Well, I was about to leave, but as Martha said, told me, that's really impolite. <laughs> you just, yeah. So I'm sitting in church. I don't, I don't like to waste my time. Mm. I only like to be where I am, what I want to do, doing that. You know. And I don't know it's because I've spent seven years in prison doing some, you know, well, I meditated there. I was supposed to be there. Mm. So we stayed, and Betty Tadaleski, who's the minister, who had the, she's deep into the spiritual, the spiritualism stuff. In fact, she was she, the founder, as I recall. She was the founder. Yeah. In fact, I want to tell this side story. We eventually did a series of interviews of things with Betty, and she talked about all these spiritual experiences she had. They're up on YouTube right now, yes, right? Yeah. The, the, all your interviews with Betty. Yes. And in fact, if you go to the Temple of Universality, there's a thing where they're all there. But this specific time, this led to you. She gave a talk, and I, 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 in fact, I used to be with Betty. She used to be next to me. We're on TV. Yeah. We're filming it and stuff like that. And I played straight man to Betty. Because yeah. Betty is out there. All right. And I'd play straight man. And she'd say things I have to put in context so people could hold on to it. Well, one day she gave a talk on a healer in India named Sri Chakravarti. Okay. And Betty had been in India in 1982 at the, at the very, at the Oberoi in, in Mumbai, which is now Mumbai. And she had been in the presence of this beautiful young woman who used her hands in fire and saw healings and was stunned, stunned. 1982. Mm -hmm. So this is 2011 or 12 or something like that. We're taping Betty. And now we're going to, Martha's going to put up the title, but we don't know how to spell Sri Chakravarti. So we're out there Googling it on the internet, you know, S R I S R H R E E, all these, and boom, we hit gold. We hit gold. Sri Chakravarti interviewed by Jeffrey Mishlove. There you were. You were interviewing Sri Chakravarti in 2010, the person that Betty had t seen in India doing healings in 1982. Yeah, and I interviewed her much earlier. Oh, you did? Oh, oh so yeah. So that was yeah. again. That, that was from the original Thinking oh. Aloud series. Wow. That ran from 86 to 2002. So it would have been probably in, in the 1980s or 1990s. That was, and that was, that was slightly after Betty saw her in, in yeah, India. That's right. All right. So, Betty is out there, yeah. okay? I mean, she's who she is. Yeah. And, and we're at the church the first day, and Betty is giving messages, you know, and she goes to Martha, Wendy, I know that's not your name, but you've been in some mighty high places, and you're supposed to tell us where you've been. 
So here we are. We, we don't belong to this church. We know very little about it. We just went there to sign up for Hoyt, and we get this message. You know, this night, this has got to be 2007 or something like that. And we go, what do we do? I guess we got to tell her. What are we going to tell her about? Well, maybe we're supposed to tell her about Wendy. What is the name Wendy? She, just uh, Peter Pan. Like oh. Peter Pan. You were like Wendy in Peter Pan. So she's looking at you, talking to you directly? Talking to, talking to Martha. Uh-huh, your wife Martha. Yeah, and she calls her Wendy. I said, I know that's not your name, but you're like Wendy in Peter Pan. Uh -huh. And you've been in some mighty high places, and you're supposed to tell us. I see. So we're flummoxed. So we do the kind thing, the thing, and invite Betty to breakfast. Mm. So we meet at the Tucson Racket and Tennis Club. And there we are. This has got to be 2007, 2008. And there's Betty. We have no idea she's an ex-Marine. She's real pretty. She's blonde. She's a very prim, southern girl. And something made me say this. I leaned over and I looked at her and I said, Who are you and what are you doing? These words just came out of my mouth. And she started talking and telling us this extraordinary story about spiritualism. Mm -hmm. This extraordinary thing about how she heard of, she was led to this church where these people talked to, she could talk to, it would totally change her life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's how we sort of got into, and then the topic of life and death. See, the spiritualists believe there is, the death that we see is the death of a body, the death of the incarnated personality, but not the death of the spirit. Mm -hmm. But to the rest of us here, that's a, that's a supposition. At best, if not fantasy. Well, most religions accept something along those lines. Yes. And if you don't accept the religions, you don't believe it at all. Right. And, and many religions don't go into it. They don't go at all. Other than, all. Other than saying there's something on the other I side. I grew up in a conservative Jewish community, and basically, as far as any discussions were concerned uh, about the afterlife, it was, we don't talk about it, period. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and probably pretty much people would have said, when you're dead, you're dead. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. When it came down. So here we are in this church, mm -hmm. but by then we've already talked to our parents yeah. through Hoyt. We've gotten messages from them. My aunts came in through Martha, to Martha, not to me. Yeah. Oh, she, Martha was with Hoyt and he goes, hmm, three flowers, tulip, Tulip, Myrtle, Violet. And Martha goes, those are Daryl's aunts. So they came in yeah. to talk to Martha. Yeah. All right? So that we had, I mean, it was amazing. I had conversations. I had better conversations with my father <laughs> through Hoyt than we had one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. We sort of apologized to each other, explained our positions, you know, and it was cool. Uh -huh. My father told me that, you know, because he knew I was bitter. So you're talking about some real heartfelt communications oh. at a profound level. Oh, oh. We, this is not airy fairy no, to you. We fell into this without even looking for it. We were not, I was not looking for a, a belief system. I was not looking for, I was, I was looking for this stuff. It was, we were, in fact, this is what happens. This is what happens. How we got into this, Jeffrey, is that in 2004, and this is when I was talking to nobody. No. I was in shutdown, all right? You I had were, been out of prison a few years. 10 years. I was out of 10 years, but still, Daryl and his attitude. You know? Uh -huh. I mean, I had an attitude, uh -huh. right? I mean, in fact... Um, because you described in our previous interview uh, achieving a state of enlightenment in prison in prison that didn't erase the attitude. No, no, it didn't erase it. I, in retrospect, I'm sure it mitigated some of it, but it didn't erase it. Yeah. All right. I mean, when I got out, one of my jokes was, "No wonder they don't let ex-cons have guns." <laughs> All right. And so, so there I am. And, and I, all I wanted to do was get out of the country. That was my thing. That's why we were in Tucson, to get out of the country, yeah. find a, a neutral place to go. Right? And so um, um, we, we, we were in 2004, we're at a fundraiser for Move On, the political organization, okay? And um, we, we meet this lady. She's an older lady. And usually older ladies in the foothills in Tucson are Republicans. Well, when, when, when Michael Moore was talking about Bush, this lady next to me was muttering. Okay, she, she was, boy, did she have an attitude. In fact, I started laughing. I poked Martha and said, you know, you got to check this lady out. So we, we became very good friends with her. You know, we, she, Martha said, we, we're going to adopt you. Your kids don't, you know, if you're going to talk about a president like that, we're not, I'm not going to pay for the phone call. She said, her daughter said that. Martha said, we're going to adopt you. All right. We became close friends with her. She introduced us to Hoyt Robinette. 
and that artist that we sent you the Maitreya of. Yes, Two extraordinary different people. Mm -hmm. And Pat Gallinette was so sweet. She goes, I don't know why they relate like me so much. All I did was introduce them to two, two people. Two people who changed our lives. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, two people who really changed their life. So that happened in 2004 at the movie. We met her. Ten, no, five years later, I'm in a direct voice with Hoyt. Mm -hmm. A direct voice is when the medium drops out. All right. When you're in a in a private session with mainly psychics, they're they're hearing things, and they're, I call them like PBX operators. Mm -hmm. You know, you ask a question and they they listen. They they're told they you know, repeat what they've heard. They they repeat what they've heard. Yeah. Okay. But direct voice, they're gone. Direct voice, they speak using their voice, but that person is out in trance. All right. In fact, with Hoyt. You, he starts it by doing the Lord's Prayer with you. And halfway through the Lord's Prayer, he just, just drops out and you finish it. And my joke with Hoyt was, Hoyt, it's not that hard to memorize the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, he just couldn't say it anymore, so dropped out of half. Yeah. No, but he's out. And his gatekeeper came in, Dr. Kenner. Now, by 2009, I knew Dr. Kenner pretty well. I was seeing Dr. Kenner far more than I was seeing you this period of time, even though we knew each other. Because every time Hoyt came, we go see Hoyt, Hoyt going to trance, and Dr. Kenner's the gatekeeper. So mm -hmm. we knew we knew Dr. Kenner. Yeah. You become familiar with, with, with this energy. Sessions. He says, okay. So there's Dr. Kenner. And he says, uh, do you have any questions? I go, No. I said, but I really would like to thank you. He says, For what? I said, I'm at this stage of my life, because that's how I'm sixty nine. Okay. No, I, got, I was 64. I'm 64. 64 there. And I said, what are people putting the car in the garage, draining the oil, you know, locking up, shutting things down? And I said, this spiritualism has been like a back, backstage pass. All right, to the other side. I didn't even know it existed, and I got a pass to the backstage. And he goes, well, it all started with the movie. And I go, movie? He says, yes. The movie and the woman. And I'm still flummoxed. And we're in the dark. This is 2009. This is what he's telling me. The movie and the woman? He says, yes. The movie and the woman named Pat Galenette. We met her at that movie. Oh, yes. Shock. Got me straightened up. And he said, of course. This was planned decades in advance. Okay, so when we talk about death, or when I talk about death, it's with, now, it's with a very different, I hold it totally differently than I did before. One of my sayings before I got into spiritualism was death was a slap on the face of God. I just instinctively said, that's what death is. That was my own little subtitle. Now I know that what we call death does not happen, at least the way we think it does. In, in other words, you were saying if death I exists, then God oh, doesn't. Yeah, it's, uh, how can that be? Uh, you're, you're right. You're right. In a sense, I never thought of it that way, but yeah. that's what it was. <laughs> death is a slap on the face of God. Yeah. It sort of ran contrary to the oneness, right. or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And I'm not feel yeah. steep in theology, you know, but <laughs> it just came to me. That's how you felt. That's how I felt. Death is a slap on the face. It just came to me. Yeah. And so we fall into this world through Hoyt of where we're talking to them. I'm talking to my father, you know, things that you don't believe. Like, I mean, what we told you about how we became ministers, yes. you know, you chose. I said, we didn't choose. We were in a trance circle and, and, and we were there and, and it came in and, and Martha was getting a message from her mother and her mother goes, isn't that wonderful? My little girl's going to become a minister. Martha and I go, what? You know, but you know, you hear a lot of stuff. In trance and not out. Now, let me just uh, interject for a second, because as I recall, at the last interview we did on spiritualism, some viewers posted a note saying, what a fool this man is. He doesn't understand cold readings. I would think that, too. Uh -huh. I would think if I didn't believe this could happen, yeah. I would make up a reason why it didn't happen. Yeah. I would do that mm -hmm. because when the mind cannot accept the phenomena, it will make it, it will make it your your disbelief reasonable. Yeah. My joke about um, 
Um, like if I was a skeptic during the time of Jesus and I hear about him turning water into wine, I would draw a parallel between Jesus and his relationship with Joseph of Marathia, uh, 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 who was a merchant. And I would say he had a lot of bad old wine that he couldn't get rid of. And so at the party, Jesus asked him for a favor. So he showed up and gave him all this free wine and it turned into a miracle. The story of Jesus turning water into a miracle. And everybody who didn't want to believe it would believe my story. Yeah. They would believe my story because I would give them something to hang their hook, have to hang their disbelief on. Right. So I understand people's disbelief. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe this stuff before I ran into it, Jeffrey. In, In fact, fact Yazi is here. You know, he's a, yes, you Yossi, came we, to we, Albuquerque we, with you with as a friend. We're all ministers yes. in the church. Uh -huh. Yazi and I would say, here we are, Hoyt's giving messages, and we're going, How's he getting this stuff? We're looking. You know, our minds, the intellectual, rational mind will not believe the irrational. Mm -hmm. I used, to, you know, I've used the I Ching for years. And one of my beliefs about the I Ching to use it, you have to dispense with the rational. You have to dispense with the idea that you cannot shake three coins six times, consult a book, and find out about what's going on in your life. That is an irrational thought. I have used that 50 years. It's been like radar. Mm -hmm. It's told me things. I mean, it still does. All right. But, but what the, all you rationalists out there, you have my love. <laughs> <laughs> you know, have patience. Mm -hmm. Just have patience. Well, and we've done many interviews on this channel oh. showing that a, uh, an understanding that can include a, an afterlife and uh, uh, pre-life pre can be quite rational. I, I, yeah, I love that. Because it expands the idea of rationality. Yeah. All right? I have such dubious attitude about the rational mind. I've, I've also held, one held that the mind is, is a, <laughs> the rational mind is our, is our biggest enemy here on this planet. You know, I told you the story about my cat. And my, my cat was real smart. I used to be on my hands and knees, talk to my cat. And I said, I know you're thinking. It's not good. It's, this, this is not, not a good process. process. The cat would the tell cat. you. No, I tell the cat. You tell the cat. Yeah, it's not. I know what you're thinking. Uh -huh. It's not good. Uh -huh. Stop it before you get too far into it. It's a trap. Uh -huh. Thinking is a trap. Because thinking will lead you. Thinking will give anybody the evidence they're looking for. So here we are it, with the spiritualism. And I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden I'm realizing or thinking that this stuff is true. Because I'm talking. This didn't come in through other things. This is, I, I wasn't looking for evidence of afterlife. It had to come to me in my own time. And it did. And so I ended up at a spiritualist church. I didn't have to buy the sp ideology of spiritualism because I already met Hoyt. I was already talking to my parents on the other side. You know, they'd, they'd already been communicating with us. They'd already been making predictions. We had actual experience with the other side. Well, you know, Daryl, when you first proposed, or when we had the discussion that led to this topic on life and death, you shared with me a story of a young 18-year-old girl who died, uh, Elizabeth Blue. Okay, now... Remember our previous talk was about suffering? Yes. Let me tell you how that hooks in. Yes. Uh, so Martha and I are in, 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 in we're in, uh, in Tucson, and we're part of this uh, Diksha group. It's an Indian meditation thing, hands on, okay? And anyway, it was a couple from Berkeley. We loved them. We we're all Bay Area refugees, okay? And uh, Lucia and Zelly. And Lucia's daughter was, she was 17 years old, Elizabeth, very beautiful, and she had moved out of the house in high school. So she's living on a very independent girl, okay? And then Elizabeth goes away to college, all right? And so we didn't know her very well, but she, we knew who she was. She passed through, never sat in the spiritual meetings and stuff like that, okay? So that was in 2007, 2008, all right? Now, so I do a tr seminar with Lucian Zelli called opening to the heart okay we're in the middle of this seminar that they're doing and one of our friends we're in the middle of dealing with our parental relationships right <laughs> and our friend goes boy i never thought we were going to get into this <laughs> i said oh opening the heart sounds real wonderful if they said getting it straight with mom and dad none of us would have signed up <laughs> all right but there we were dealing with our parental relationship okay and 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 as part of that process we pulled a tarot card now, Jeffrey, you got to realize this is 2007. I am 60-something years old, 
Okay, 62. And I've never pulled my tarot card. Because I, and I'm a hippie. Yeah. Hippies were into the tarot. Yeah. The fool, we all knew the, all that stuff. But I, I had I had the I Ching, so I had no need for that. Alice, you know, Alistair Crowley, all the interpretation. I thought I had a pure strain, the arrogance of the mind. Okay, so I pulled my card. I had never done it before. I'm at sixty two. I hit me. That's amazing. I pulled my card. It's number five. I go hand it to Lucia, the higher font, the teacher. Remember, Hoyt said you're a teacher. Yes. I get that card. You're a teacher. All right, and I give it to Lucia. I go. What does this mean? She says, learning through adversity, suffering. And I told you, we talked about suffering the last time, learning through adversity. And then she says, that's Elizabeth's card. And I, I thought, this beautiful 17-year-old girl, I wonder what's going to happen to her. Because I've been to prison twice. I've had a life that was so extreme that it was you could barely hang on. And here's a 17-year-old girl. And, and Lucia said, Elizabeth's really mad about it. Mm. <laughs> really, you know. Yeah. Okay. This is what happens. That's 2007 or 8. Well, a few years later, in 2011, Martha would always have this th uh, Thanksgiving for what she called the odds. And, you know. and you would never think Lucian Zelli and her family would come over. Ever, ever. Because they're a family. They got a pod. They do. It's Thanksgiving. And Martha said for almost no reason, she turns to Zelli and said, uh, listen, if you guys want to come over for Thanksgiving? And Zelli goes, God, yes. And the reason was this. The kids were teenagers, rebellious. Mm -hmm. And she said, sitting across from these two kids at the dinner table with a turkey in the middle was not going to make things better. Okay. okay? So we invite them to dinner. Mm -hmm. Wonderful day. We get to know them. And our time, you know, we, we have this big dinner. So they're done. One year later, and I think, um, I think uh, Elizabeth was like 21 at this time. The week before Thanksgiving, she gets a diagnosis of lymphoma, brain cancer. They come over. We don't talk about it. Okay. Grace, they're gone. And then the year goes on. Now, Tucson is full of healers. Um, you know, we heal like other people play Little League. All right? <laughs> I mean, we're into it, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and so all these people were doing these things and everybody thought it was going to turn out. It got worse. Mm -hmm. It turned for the worst. Uh, she got an aneurysm. They brought her in hospice. Okay. Intense. So we're sitting there and we're just bringing them food, you know, cause I cook, you know, I, we wouldn't ask, we just do that. And then, and, and Elizabeth knew who we were. She, she would, she would come to the church sometime with, with, uh, with, when we were talking, when we were doing it. So there was a connection in there somehow. Okay. She, and Lucia calls us and she says, Elizabeth wants you guys to come. And she was laying in the bed. They had turned the bed, the living room into a, Flower, it was hot. It was, you know, she was, she could barely talk because of the trach, the thing like that. It's just she was going out now, okay, at the time. And Martha, they leaned down and they talked and said something. And then it was my turn, okay. <laughs> I leaned down and I told Elizabeth. You're talking to a 21 year old dying person. She's about from dying beautiful from Beautiful young girl. Beautiful young girl going out. I'm, I'm, she's she's going to last maybe a week. Everybody is around trying to be healing, being positive, and she's dying. dying. So I leaned down and I said to Elizabeth, I said, I just don't want to be trite. <laughs> I had to say something stupid. And she laughed. I said, but thank you for including us in your life. Okay, the last time we see her. Mm -hmm. Then they have this memorial, huge memorial in Tucson. A lot of people come, all right? And they had people reading her poetry. Jeffrey, it was stunning. The poems, at the age of 11, she knew. I mean, if you go up to, if you Google Elizabeth, Elizabeth Blue poems, you will find her on, on the web because her mother, Lucia, Maya, Maya Lucia, put a website up about Elizabeth Blue. And what I would ask everybody to do, because it's so important, I think to me it's important, it's significant, go to the website and look at her poems, but start at her youngest age, 9, 11, 13, 16, 7, like this, okay? They're stunning. It was like, in one, she says, I'm in the shadows with the spirits who know me. I am one of them. They are one of me. And it was like she knew she was at the age of 11. She knew, she, and she, and one of the things, she says, I hope you live and fight and lay down and die. It was like she knew. She lived in a whole, she saw, she was in a, connected in a way that we never knew as parent, as friends of her parents. 
She was precognitive. Okay. So then she, we're stunned. Then what happens? A month later, we're in a trance circle at the temple with Christine Facetti. She's in a trance. And we had just come back from the Bay Area. And one of Martha's friends had passed away. He was a rock and roll blues musician named Robbie. Okay. And St. Germain comes into the trance circle. See, that's the extraordinary thing about Christine. She can channel these different high levels. St. Germain comes in, and he asks if there's any questions. And this is something that rarely happens. <coughs> and Martha goes, uh, yeah, I, I like uh, my friend Robbie. I found out he just died, and I want to know if he's all right. And St. Germain pauses, and Rosie, Robbie's quite fine. He's, he's all right. He says, there's someone here who wants to talk to you. And it was Elizabeth Blue. And she told Martha, because Lucia had been beating herself up for how she had parented all her guilt, all the times she had felt she had said the wrong thing or not given her permission, all those things a mother thinks when her daughter dies at the age of 22. All, all of it. To tell my mother she was perfect. She did nothing wrong. Tell my mother that. And she ended it. It was stunning. The word, she, it was like a, it was like a roll coming through the room. I love you. I love you. I love, it was like a, it's an, a wave after wave of, I love, and th that's how it faded out. And we're like, holy smokes. And then the next trans circle, the next month, we were told that Elizabeth had been a master. Now, who do we know about masters? Dewall Cool, St. Germain, the names we give for, G, you know, master, master souls. We don't know who anybody is. We don't know from the low to the high. I mean, that's why that, that song, uh, God's just another one of us, you know, on the bus, you know, who go, trying to find his way home, you know, who wrote that. That's really true because we all are God, but we're not personally God. We're impersonally God. All right. And, and Elizabeth, she was beautiful. I mean, she was, and she lit it. And she came back to have this short life. We have no reason, we have no idea why. But she was a master soul, or at least that's what we're taught. I, I have nothing else. I believe it. You read her poetry. But stunning. Insightful. So insightful about life itself at 13. At 13. That you, this, they read her poetry at the, at the funeral, at the memorial service. So we had a different vision of Elizabeth after she had passed him before. But we, let's go back to the beginning. When Lucia told me at the seminar, number five, learning through adversity. And we were talking about suffering. Yeah. We have no idea why she came in to live that short life and to suffer. We have no idea. We have no idea why any of us suffer. We don't, I mean, we have no, because Suffering is a term given by uncomfortableness. We know that uncomfortableness oftentimes is the only thing that causes us to change. My joke growing, you know, was like, you know, if we were five years old and we didn't have to get off the, on the, 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 the little rocking horse, we'd still be at the party screaming not to get off the rocking horse. We don't want to stop the good thing. But we are in a I'm not going to call it an illusion and saying that it's not real. We're in a phenomena of life, life and death. What is it? You know, Jeffrey, when I started my quest, I didn't start when I became a hippie. I started way before. And I, I, was, a, I was a kid. I was a young teenager, a teenager before then. And I, I, the question came to me, what's going on? It was a straight out question. What's going on? And I was suspicious. I knew something was going on and I didn't know what it was. I was going to church. I didn't. How do you? It's somebody's story. Your uncle tells you, well, this is why your mom's like that. Maybe, maybe not. He knows her better than you do, but maybe he's wrong too. Yeah. Your mom has a story about why she was the way he was and probably blame your uncle. <laughs> All right? Everybody's got a story. Everyone about this. So what this is, what we call life, in one way is a set. It's an empty set with figures, persons, life, and stuff like that. And that's what all of us have done, in, at least the ones I think watching your program. The people watching your program have decided, well, you know, there might be something more than what I think. I'm willing to listen to other points of view. There are other channels out there. That ain't it. 
That is, there's something going on out there and I know what it is. I ain't going to listen to anybody else. Your channel is, there's something going on out there. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe they know. And these guys are really interesting. That's what you've done. You've <laughs> poked around at the edge. All right? And what I, my feeling is this. What we don't know is what we want to know. What we don't already have experienced is what we want to experience. And as general as that is, I think because of the way the universe, it's going to bring it to us. I have faith, Jeffrey. I mean, you know, in the Bible when it said, oh, ye of little faith, you're talking about me. <laughs> I, I used to say my appropriate headstone should be, here lies Daryl Robert Schoon. He had everything except faith. You know, I've had incredible, I've got friends, I've got, and I'm <laughs> like, you know, What's going to happen? What's going to, I mean, how many miracles do I need? How many coincidences do I need? How many? Well, you know, it may be endless. And it, I don't, time will take forever for me to get it. Or it may not. Maybe, maybe, maybe what happened, maybe I'm close. But I, until you're there, you don't know. But I do know that I've experienced things that other people, that I didn't experience, expect to experience. In prison, that state of oneness, Jeffrey, I was talking to it. I knew, in fact, one of Marshall's friends found out that I was, I, Marshall told him, Daryl got, <laughs> and when he was in prison, he was maintained, and he came up to me and said, he said, so you got there? I go, yeah. He said, so did I. I go, really? He said, yeah. And he said, how did you, you know, he said, how long did it last? I said, I'm not sure, because when you're there, it really is timeless. You know, you, you don't count. You just know you're there, all right? And he, and he said, well, what happened when it was over? <laughs> I said, nothing. I said, I really didn't expect it to come. I just, it just happened to me. He said, I got pissed. I said, you did? He said, yeah. I was doing kundalini yoga to get there. You know, fire breath. And then I got there and then he wasn't there anymore. He said, he got pissed. He thought it was going to last forever. You know, ah, you climb out of the hole. Oh man, you get your leg up. Oh, you know, and you're pulling your leg up because you're afraid that the alligator is going to get your leg. You get your leg up. You know, uh, you're lying there, you catch your breath and then you find yourself in the hole again. Well, that's what it's like when you've been there and you find yourself not there again. All right. Now, part of me is there. Part of me is not there. Part of you is there. Part of you is not there. Part of all of us is there. Part of us is not there. Getting those two parts to communicate is a trick. Yep. All right? And the only part that we have control over is this part. And this part is not what we think it is. Like I told you the last time, this part is afraid of it. This part is afraid of not being all this part and nothing more. This part is afraid of being limitless. This part is afraid of being forever. This part is afraid of being of the one. Because it wants to be Daryl Shoon, Jeffrey Mishlove, Linda, blah, 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 you know, Sammy, whatever. It's used to it. My metaphor about us on this planet, Jeffrey, is this. We're gods in t-shirts, but we're identifying with a t-shirt. Time to let it go. And this is what I think is going to happen. Because we talk about the future. We talk about the changes that we're in now. And I can only say this. I know in my life, the greatest changes have been forced on me. With a little help. But they've been forced on me. And when you, we talked after when I just came and you said, Daryl, how are you? I said, Jeffrey, I've never felt better. I've never felt more confident. I've never felt more centered. And you go, really? <laughs> you weren't that way when I left. Yeah. And I said, he said, what do you think? I said, I said, I said coronavirus. Really? And what I said was this, because the possibility or the existence of coronavirus and all the rest of the dissolution of our institutional framework, life as we know it, the planet, species extinction, the rising temperatures, all this stuff like that, there's no safety in the tonal, in the world of objects, in the world of things. We can talk about it. We can project. We can say what we want to happen. The only way that I have found to have any peace at all and happy, because I want happiness, is to retreat to the Nagual, to the internal. Doesn't mean to deny what's happening out there. Doesn't mean to say, oh, you know, Donald's a child of God. You just have to love Donald through it. Fuck you. <laughs> you go ahead and do it. You know, I have no patience. You know, I'm trying to get acceptance and tolerance. You know, I'm not going to love Donald through this. Let him go through it. 
All right? But, and people say that of loving hearts. Fine, go to it. But my thing is, it is. Let it be. It's a collective result of a collective consciousness that no longer is in existence. And the more we stay in it, the more it lingers. All right? I believe I am an optimist, Jeffrey. And you are talking to a person who is, I mean, we go to parties and Martha said, don't talk about this stuff, Daryl. You're going to scare people. Martha got the angel of doom. I know what the downside is. But when you when you've got to be a spiritualist, and you know there is no real that, that takes a lot of the sting out of it. Mm -hmm. But we still want our children to be happy. We want our friends not to die of Alzheimer's or to recover from this or to make it through. And we pray we pray for them. I mean, we pray for them. We're ministers. That's what ministers do. We prayed for Elizabeth Blue. We prayed for Elizabeth Blue. We did. We supported it. All right. And and we know it's not in our hands because we don't see the overall plan. But we know there is a plan, Jeffrey. That's what f I have faith in. This was a man with no faith. Jeffrey, this was a man with questions that appeared to be... Uh, um, yeah, that's great. I see myself in a better light. I would have described myself before as a, a, a fearful, tentative, you know, unsure, a fearful person. What I really was, I, had, I was a person with questions. And I had fear. But the questions led me to answers that overcame the fear. And I didn't lead, I didn't go to them to overcome the fear. I, I went and I found, I went for the answers because I wanted to know the truth. And that's what, what you're doing is so extraordinary. Because the truth is not found in the present gestalt or zeitgeist of our culture. This zeitgeist of our culture is a compendium of belief systems, of people who brought it here, different cultures. And fine, it's great. we got all these different kinds of food. But that's all it is. It's their excuses for the way it is. Their reasons that we made up for this thing being so horrible. <laughs> yeah. You know, blaming them, blaming this. That's all they are. And there's no blame. But to know that, you have to get through it and to let yourself be led. And that's when you get to know that. That's why I, you're, you, you talked about God and what you saying. I went and I listened because I wanted to know what you thought about. And it was so, because you were open. You had basically said, listen, there's all these definitions. Fine. But let's look at it at another way. All right. That it may not be the way, it may not be the way we think it is. I mean, I had a direct conversation with God when I was in my state. <laughs> sort of embarrassing what happens. I'm sitting there at Lampo, and I said, here, there you are, you as I. All right. <laughs> I put it, mm -hmm. that we're all one. You yeah. as I. God was seeing through your eyes. Yes, yeah, himself. Okay. Yeah. And the next day, the answer came back unequivocal. All is me. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not get a little too carried away with this, we're all one. Yeah. All is me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I loved it. Because the one thing I am comfortable with is being a part of something of love. I am comfortable with that. I know what I want for you, what God wants for you is better than what I want for you. Because it, he wants, it wants the best for all of us. That, that's my belief about God. And I was a person who didn't believe it. I was a person who was highly suspicious of reality. You know, people and motives and things like that. And I am now, I'm happier than I've ever been, Jeffrey. I believe it. Huh. <laughs> I believe it. I feel it. Daryl, Robert Schoon, once again, a delightful conversation you're sharing from your heart and from your soul. And uh, from all the feedback I've been getting, it resonates <laughs> with our audience. So I am so grateful for you to be here once again with me. It seems as if each time we get together, the conversation goes deeper. And you know, and I trust it. I trust where you're taking this, Jeffrey. Yeah. I do. I, 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 I you know, I, I, like I said, I, I, I don't like to talk to people because it triggers so many things in people. But with you, your curiosity mm -hmm. and your faith just lets me, you know, it's like the dog in the thing. Take him off the leash. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and very few people have done that with yeah. me. Well, we've got uh, more conversations yeah. coming while you're here in Albuquerque. Okay. Thank you for being with me now, Daryl. Namaste. Namaste. And thank you for being with us.